Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you're all very welcome here this, this afternoon. I'm very pleased to see you all here. My name's Joyce O'Connor, and I chair the Digital Future Group here at the Institute. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome David Gunning here with us today. But before I introduce you, David, may I just say what the housekeeping rules are. If you can turn off your mobiles, please. And just to say that the presentation is on the record and the questions and answers aren't. It's, it's a really great pleasure, David, to welcome you here, and it's an honour to the Institute. And David is going to be talking to us today about something that we probably all have thought about but haven't had the luxury of working on, about explainable artificial intelligence. David is the Programme Manager in the Information Innovation Office of the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. And if you ever get the opportunity to listen to DARPA's YouTubes, it's absolutely fascinating because there's so much information there presented in a very accessible way. And I've been lucky to listen to this. And one of the things I heard, David, was that at I think the age of eight, right. you saw the Sputnik go over, um, and that was the beginning of your interest in technology. I also remember my dad bringing me out to see the Sputnik, but our, our careers went in different <laughs> directions. <laughs> David has over 30 years' experience in the development of AI technology, and at the moment manages the explainable AI as well as computer Communication with Commuters program. This is David's third tour of DARPA, and I can explain that DARPA has tours for four years, so David has had three tours, and it's there to get the excitement, interest, and development on each tour. They're all different. Mm -hmm. But he's also worked, as you can imagine, in startups, in industry, in research, so he's had a very distinguished career. And he's previously managed the PAL, or the personalised assistant that learns that pr the product or the project that produced Siri. He's at the intersection, I think, of human, the human mind and computer science. And I say that because, and maybe there's some similarity between us, David, and that you did do, do well, I did sociology, you did cognitive psychology but then went on to do a master's in Stanford in computer science. So that, I think, perspective within that area is, is very valuable, and I think it defines a lot of the work that you do. So we are asking the question, can AI be taught to explain itself? As machine learning becomes more powerful, people working in the area increasingly find themselves unable to account for what they know or what they don't know. And I suppose today we're really, really honoured to have you, David, here to talk to us about explainable artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. This is uh, my first trip to Ireland and really enjoyed Dublin. My ancestors came from here in the 1850s from Sligo County, so it's a real pleasure to see my homeland. Um, so as you said, I'm going to give a talk on explainable AI. This is a project I'm running now at DARPA. We started about a year and a half ago. It's a four-year program, so we're just beginning to get some results, but I can kind of give you an idea of what the program is about. Um, so here's the uh, premise, the need for the program, which I think we're all aware of, is just to say we've now had this explosion of new AI technology. A lot of applications of AI, especially of machine learning and deep learning that are behind it, and so that's being applied in medicine to do radiology, it's being applied you know, to do uh, 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 sentencing in, in criminal justice, it's being applied in a lot of places in defense, especially in intel analysis and in the development of autonomous systems. So this new technology is much more powerful than what AI technology could do previously, kind of since 2012 is when this kind of revolution started with deep learning. So it's very effective, but the models are very complex and difficult for an average user to understand. So that's, that's the problem we're trying to address. And 
So here's a little, most people now beginning to get tutorials on deep learning, which is really the heart of the technology. And these, this kind of simplified version of it will kind of give you a basic idea of what's happening in these systems. So these machine learning systems can always learn to do a function, a classification or prediction. That means you give it one set of data as an input, it's going to give you an output that, that gives you a classification or a prediction. And this is done by feeding huge amounts of training data to these systems, and that's what has to be done to make them work. So let's say you fed the system millions of images or photographs, you've had thousands of objects in there, and you've labeled them all. You said, oh, this, ob this is a cat, this is a chair, this is a house, this is a table, and you do that over and over again. And what happens in the layers of this neural net, you feed it the input at the top, you give it the classification at the bottom, it learns how to weight the input. It's calculating you know, numeric weights in every node of this neural net so it can do the correct classification. So that's where the, the magic happens. And now since 2012, this technology has actually been around since the 80s, the basic idea of a neural net. But in around 2012, several things came together. One, there was enough data, plenty of data out there on the internet. We had more computing power, and we could use GPUs and new computing infrastructure to do computing on these systems like we couldn't before, and minor changes to this architecture. And then suddenly, this stuff was doing much better at image recognition, speech recognition, kind of orders of magnitude better than what had been done before. So that's what, what came about. Now, in terms of explainability, there's kind of good news and bad news in these systems. You see this picture on the left, or on your right. Um, these systems have layers, and they can have thousands of layers with millions of these neurons. As they inspect what's happening in the layers, there tends to be, at the early layers, they're detecting simple features like edges, colors textures. At the later layers, it's detecting more abstract parts or features or concepts, till at the very bottom, it's learning to classify this picture as a wolf or a, a dog, right? When people inspect these systems, they find out it's actually detecting features in these inner layers that people would understand. Okay, there are, it, just like our visual system, we naturally, you know, will organize information we see in the world and recognize concepts that are reusable, that are important for us to understand. The bad news is the net has no idea what to call this feature. As far as the net is concerned, it's a particular equation to calculate a weight at one of these nodes. So when the user gets an answer out of one of these things, he has no idea why it did it. The only thing he gets is the numeric weight of the node at the bottom. Said, oh, this, and more likely this is a dog. That, that was the highest weight. So that's kind of the challenge we're trying to work with. How can you take these systems, still take advantage of their power, but find a way to pull out the features, the concepts, the logic of what's happening in the net and make it more explainable? So this is a kind of a simple version of what we're trying to do in the program. The top level, the top row here is the standard machine learning, deep learning process today. You have a lot of training data. You need thousands, sometimes millions of examples of training data to train these systems. You feed that through a learning process. That then learns a learn function or a model. You can then take that model and feed it a new piece of data, like this picture of the cat, and if it's trained properly, pretty, you know, pretty high probability it's going to get the right answer. It's going to say, I think this is a cat. If you say why, it'll say, well, the, the node for a cat had a weight of 0.93. And that's about all the explanation you'll get. You can't say, well, why isn't a tiger? Or, you know, tell me more about why you thought that was a cat. You just don't get that out of these systems, and that's the problem. So the row on the bottom is what we're trying to do to remedy the problem, and that's really to do and make two changes to this process. One is to change the machine learning process so you get a more explainable model. 
So you identify what those features are inside. You somehow get more semantic information out of the net. Maybe you change its architecture so it's organized in a way that makes it more explainable. And there's a wide variety of techniques people are trying, and I'll show you a few examples of those. The second thing is going back to my background in cognitive psychology is to make sure you put together the right explanation interface so you can, you can generate an understandable, compelling explanation for the human user. And in this case, our target is an end user, not a machine learning expert, right? Not someone who's an engineer who understands the technology, but the end user, a lawyer, a doctor, a soldier, whoever's depending on this system to make decisions and see if they can get an explanation that's useful for them. So here, I believe, is, the, is, is our characterization of the goal, and I believe there's an inherent trade-off between the performance of these AI systems and how explainable they are. So it's much like with people. There are people that are they're incredibly brilliant but can't explain anything. There are people that make great instructors but may not be the most brilliant researcher at the university, right? So there's something going on here in these, same, these systems. If you have the largest, most complex deep learning system, that's learning all of these internal features, it may not be possible to make that completely explainable, right? And there are other machine learning techniques like a decision tree or linear regression that are much more explainable to people, but they're not quite as high performing. Now, there is some debate about this. I have machine learning people that argue if we really get the architectures of these things right, if we really get explainability right, we'll actually improve the learning performance. But so far, that hasn't been shown to be the case. But that's kind of an open question if eventually we may get it all, right? Make these systems more explainable and more higher performing. But right now, I think we're stuck with this trade-off. So the goal of our, my program is just to move this curve up and to the right. These orange, yellow dots are kind of where we are today. And I want to make a, have a portfolio of techniques so any given person that's developing a new system they can look at how important is performance, how important is explainability for their application, and their new techniques that they can use to make that trade-off better for whatever purpose they have. So here are the two application areas, challenge areas, that we're working on that are really generally applicable in a lot of areas, but they're certainly important to U.S. Department of Defense. One is if you have an AI system that's doing data analytics on masses of multimedia data. So, uh, you know, we have Intel analysts that are flooded with images, photos, overhead images of all sorts of situations in the world. They have to pour through all that data and find items of interest, find where there's new activity in North Korea, you know, what's happening in Syria, that sort of thing. But there's too much information for them to look at manually, so you have to use AI systems to pull up the most relevant you know, uh, uh, targets for them to look at. They need explanations so they know why the system has pulled up a particular item. You know, we started the program, I was at a workshop with some intel analysts from, from the U.S. government, and one of the ladies there is talking about, the, the workshop was basically a lot of machine learning people trying to pitch their new technology to the analysts, and she said, well, this doesn't solve my problem. She already had big data, data analytics, systems that were giving her recommendations, but she's saying she has to put her name on the recommendation that goes up the chain, and if that's wrong, she's blamed, not the AI system. And so to her, having that explanation was kind of the most important you know, facet of the system. The second area is autonomy, right? Of course, self-driving cars, you know, we're in the middle of beginning to develop all sorts of autonomous systems for the Defense Department, right? So, and this is a more, still, it's not quite here, right? A lot of these things are in development. You don't see a lot of these autonomous systems out in the field yet. And the ones that are coming soonest are not really very heavy in AI technology. They're programmed with much simpler control logic. But, but the people in the research universities are now using this deep learning technology to train robots, to train autonomous driving systems, to train autonomous air vehicles. And when that's done, if an operator sends one of these systems off on a mission and it comes back, he'll want to know 
why did you make the decisions you did? Why did you turn around? Why did you succeed or fail? Unless there's more explainability built into the deep learning versions of these systems, he won't be able to get that information. So those are the two challenge problems we're having our researchers work on. Um, probably a little small for you to read. Of course, it brings up the question of how do you know if you have an effective explanation? What makes an ex explanation you know, better than another? And we'd love it if we could find an automated way to measure that, but I don't think, it, as far as I know, we can't do that yet. Because the quality of the explanation depends on a human user reading that explanation and getting a better understanding of how the system works. So the only way we know to measure this is to actually build some of these systems, put them in front of a user, have him use the system, get decisions, get recommendations, but then measure everything we can about it to see if he has a better understanding of the system as a result of the explanation. So we could ask them, oh, are they satisfied with that, with the an answer? One of the most important aspects is, does it give the user the right mental model of what the system is doing? So you want the person to know, have an uh, intuition on when the system is strong and when it's weak. When should he trust it? When shouldn't he trust it? If you gave the user a hypothetical situation, can he predict what the system will do? So that's some of the techniques we're using to see if the system gives the user an accurate mental model. And it won't be an, a model that's completely the same as the complex math model inside the AI system, but does it give him the right intuition or the right kind of analogous sit, uh, model so he understands uh, what the system is doing? Uh, second, you can measure their task performance. Of course, if the human and machine are doing a task together, they should do a better job if you have explanation. Do they trust it appropriately? Is there calibrated trust? And it's kind of, it can be relatively easy to trick a person into either blindly trusting or blindly mistrusting one of these systems. So the goal here is to not do either one of those, but to give the person a better idea when they can trust it and when they can't. There's some experiments done in psychology where they'll show people two different computer systems. And in one case, they put a smiley face on the computer, and people will actually trust that one more, right? So there's just all sorts of quirks of human nature that make us either trust it when we shouldn't or mistrust it when we should. So we're hoping explanation will help correct that. Um, this is a little more technical diagram. This, this Venn diagram, which you probably can't read, is a description of all the different machine learning techniques. There's neural nets and deep learning that's so popular, but there are other statistical techniques like support vector machines. There are these graphical models like Bayesian belief nets. There are simpler systems like decision trees. So we are looking at that whole uh, portfolio of techniques, although deep learning is the most important and the hot topic these days. So this is where I get this curve, where some of these techniques are high performing, but not very explainable. Others are more explainable, but but not as high performing. This is gonna show us three broad strategies that we're employing on the program. Uh, first, what I'll call deep explanation, which means uh, do whatever you can to make deep learning more explainable. So that's the, you know, the most severe problem. It's where all the activity is these days. So more than half of the performers on my program are trying to do something there. I'll show you some examples of ways they can make these systems more explainable. The second one in the middle is what I'm calling interpretable models. So this is to say don't use deep learning. Use some other machine learning technique that will learn a structured Bayesian graph or Bayesian belief net or learn a decision tree or something that has more structure that makes it more explainable. And the last uh, technique I'm calling model induction this is a little bit like what people do with rationalization. We don't always know what our deep nets, why they've made a certain decision, but we can make up a plausible story that kind of fits our history and, you know, and, and the situation. So in this case, I'd have the explanation system will not try to understand what's happening internally in this black box system, but the explanation system can experiment with it, run millions of simulation examples, try every input 
every input combination and see what's the output and see if it then can infer some logic that explains what the, what the system is doing. So I have different teams working on all of these, often combinations of these. And these are the 12 teams working on the program. <laughs> Up on the right, there's one team that's not developing a system. They're just a group of cognitive psychologists that have uh, studied the psychology of explanation. There's a lot of research in education, right, in decision making, et cetera, on when is one explanation better than another? When does an explanation contribute to a good decision? When does an explanation contribute to learning? So they're just there to dig through all that literature, find the most useful you know, nuggets out of all of that and give it to the other members of the team. The other uh, table you see here are 11 teams who are working on different versions of how to make these AI systems explainable. Uh, three are working on both autonomy and data analytics. Three are working only on autonomy, and five are working only on analytics, and they're pursuing a wide variety of approaches. Uh, you know, some are heavy in deep learning, others are only doing a model induction or rationalization technique and different combinations. So here, in terms of the deep nets, here are four different approaches that people are, are trying uh, to make these systems more explainable. And I'll show you some follow-up examples of a few of these. Um, first is, is tension mechanisms, or salience maps, as they're called. And this is a technique that's uh, even in use today. A lot of our researchers are trying to refine it to make it more effective. And that's basically... If this case, uh, you've given this image to a deep net, it said, this is a picture of goldfish. And if you say, why do you think they're goldfish? It's highlighted exactly the pixels, you know, around the goldfish in the image. You can trace back through the net and see what in the input was it paying attention to, what data, what pixels in this case made it, contributed to it making that decision. So that can often be a very useful uh, explanation. Like one of the researchers who did an early version of this uh, did a test system where they trained it to distinguish wolves from huskies, okay? And then they could ask the system, you know, why did you make this, why did you call this a wolf? And in that particular case, they trained it in a way so the system highlighted all the snow in the background, so it was, it, which is a kind of mistake these systems often make. Right? It, it happened in all the photos it was shown. Every time there was a wolf, there was also snow. So that was a much easier feature for it to grab a hold of. And so you can see from just this kind of salience map, get a lot of information about what the systems are doing. So that's one. Uh, the second one at the below that, feature identification, and I'll show you a more detailed example of this, is really at the heart of a lot of these techniques. As I mentioned, these deep nets are often discovering features on their own that are very useful and meaningful, but it just doesn't know what to call them. So we've got a variety of people in different ways who are trying to find out, recognize um, you know, useful features inside the net, find a way to associate those nodes with language or with labels or with some kind of description that they can give people. Uh, modular networks at the top, this is, in general, there's a, because of all the emphasis on deep learning, there's a huge amount of work throughout the, pro throughout the research community on how do you have better architectures for these? How do you, you know, set them up in a way so they might be more modular or so the architecture is more organized? So we're, like, we're very much like in the early days of software programming in the 80s. People would write code they used to call spaghetti code. It would just point to all over the place, and it was a mess. Nobody could understand it. But eventually, we learned how to write software so it was much more modular, much more understandable. Something like that is happening with these systems. Right now, the deep learning systems are one mass of interconnected nodes, but eventually, we'll find much more regular, organized, understandable architectures, I think, for these that will make them more explainable. And then finally, most interesting one I'll call learn to explain. And this is where the deep learning people are saying the way out of this is more deep learning. So if you've trained a deep learning system to make the decision, well, let's train a second deep learning system to generate the answer. In a sense, what it's doing is being trained to find the useful features inside the first net and generate language or images or something to explain that to the person. 
So those are the four broad techniques I can show you. Oh, did I? I didn't mean to have that slide in there. So here's an example of the salience method. This is one of the people, a group at UC Berkeley. What they're doing, you see this, this dynamic uh, image on the, on the left there. They have the image of the goldfish. They're randomly obscuring different pixels in the image and seeing how that changes the classification. So you're trying to find what are the fewest changes to the pixels that have the biggest change in the decision the net makes, and that ends up giving you kind of a very precise heat map on what the net is paying attention to. So that's one technique. Um, let me see, did I? Oh, well, I'll jump to this one. I thought I had a different slide in here, but I, this is an earlier version of the, of the, of the charts. Here's, with, again, the Berkeley group, they're doing both the heat map and this, the way out of it is more deep learning. So they, what you can see here, you get the picture of the elephant. They're testing this system by showing users an image and a question <clears throat> and saying, can you guess, will the net get the right answer to this or not? So in the no explanation case, it just shows the person that picture of the elephant and says, does this elephant have tusks? And now the user can guess whether or not it'll get the right answer. In the explanation case, they get the image of the elephant. They also see the heat map so they can see the net is paying attention to it exactly the right spot. It's looking exactly where the tusk is. But then you look at the, the language generation that comes from the second deep net. It says, because there are no bones sticking out from its mouth, right? So now you know it's, it may be looking in the right spot, but somehow it didn't pick up the right feature. So you can correctly guess it's going to get the wrong answer. And that's <laughs> what happens. In the uh, second case, this is one where it gets the right answer. Um, let's see, uh, is this a professional sporting event? You know, it both highlights, it's looking at the person's uniform and the verbal description is because they're wearing official jerseys. So things line up, you get an intuition that's going to get the right answer and it does. So this data at the bottom is just showing when they show these, uh, these different situations to people, if they don't get the explanation, they can guess what the net will do about 57% of the time. But if they have both of these explanations, that, that increases the 70%. So it really does give people a better idea of what the system is doing when it would get a right or wrong answer. Now here's a, the same group. Now this is an application of a similar technique but to an autonomous system. In this case, they've trained a system to mimic a human driver. So if you will, they've got a simple autonomous vehicle, if you will. They can then watch what that system pays attention to as it's driving down the road. You see this uh, red, green, blue heat map. You can see what is it paying attention to when it makes a turn. Independently, they've crowdsourced with a lot of people on Amazon Turk what features of a similar image do people think are important? Which parts of the image are important characteristics that are meaningful to the person? And then they can take the union of these two. They can see, okay, what did the net pay attention to? Which of these are features people thought were important? And then generates a verbal description of why the system has made a decision. So now I'll just show some very simple examples of uh, how this works. So here's the explanation. It's saying the car slows down because it's making a left turn. You can now see the heat map. You know, it's a little obscured because of the heat map, but you can see the car did indeed make a left turn. So in that case, it was a, was a good explanation. These go on a little bit. I'll show you a few of these. Here's one. The car accelerates because the light turns green and the traffic is moving. So again, you see this if you're Closer, you can see actually the green light there. So it's uh, picked up that feature that people thought were important and gives that as the explanation for what it's done. The car slows to a stop because the car in front is stopped. Pretty easy explanation indeed. That's exactly what happened. So this is fairly... Uh, Primitive, I mean, you know, just the first year of research, but there's a lot of interesting ideas here on how you can dig into these nets, right, and pull out explanations that are going to be useful to people. Oh, this is one where it actually made a mistake. I think it said it turned because it, or because it saw a stop sign, 
but it was actually a do not enter sign. So it kind of had the right idea, but misrecognized one piece of it. And, oh, I see, I've got several. I must have sent you the, well, at any rate. <laughs> Let me, these are several other researchers that are working. Here's a group at UMass and in a CRA that's learning to learn causal models using model induction. Here's a group at UCLA that learns something called a statistic and or graph, which is a more interpretable model. Um, here's a group at Oregon State that's working on an autonomous system. Um, another group at Park, they're interesting. What they're trying to do is they're taking a cognitive model developed by psychologists that try to mimic human cognition, and they map what the learning system features into this cognitive model and then use that for explanation. Uh, here's a group at Carnegie Mellon is learning a physics-based model of a system that will play Atari instead of just an uninterpretable deep learning model. Um, a group at SRI doing more f uh, feature salience map. Uh, here's the group at uh, BBN that's using work at MIT where they're recognizing reusable features inside the net. Um, here's a group at UT Dallas that's just using an interpretable model called a tractable probabilistic logical model. A uh, group at UT or Texas A&M where their test problem is actually detecting fake news. So they not only detect it, but then generate an explanation of why they think that was misinformation. Um, Rutgers, this is an interesting one that is just, this is a psychologist who's worked in an area called Bayesian teaching, which is basically if you're trying to create a tutoring system for a person, you want to select what's the next best training example to show the person that will correct his misconceptions or inform him. You know, which, which problem is the next best one for them to work on? So in the explanation case, they don't try to understand internals of the model, but they can look at all the training data. So they try to pick out which piece of training data is the one that really caused the system to make this decision. And often showing the training examples can be very informative. Here's our program schedule. Just say we're just about a year and a half through this program. All these teams have just finished their first big evaluation. We're kind of collecting all that information. You know, we'll have a big meeting in February uh, to kind of summarize all that and kind of see where we are. And then we have another two years of the program to continue to develop the technology. Uh, and this is how we're doing the evaluation. Um, in every case, the teams are uh, show their system to a user without the explanation, show it to the user with the explanation, also with partial explanations, and then measure all those parameters I showed earlier to see if the explanation actually improves the user's performance and their trust. And that's it. Thank you.